Welcome back to the lecture series, The Good Lawyer, uh, lecture number four, Independence. And if you haven't watched, I keep repeating that, if you haven't watched the previous three lectures, please go ahead and do that first. In particular, uh, lecture number three, because um, that's the lecture about partiality, because in this uh, fourth lecture, we will refer back to some of the discussion points I raised in the third lecture. But now, independence. There are two sides to the principle of independence. One uh, is concerning the group, the whole group of lawyers within a country. And the other is the principle of independence uh, within the relationship uh, of an individual lawyer with an individual client. And what do I mean by those two sides? The first side comes first. That's why it's the first side. Uh, so the, the group of lawyers in a country. In that context, independence means that the government of that country cannot interfere with the work of the lawyer. In particular, the lawyer cannot be persecuted or prosecuted or face any negative consequence for the work he or she does. Of course, if the lawyer uh, commits a criminal act, the lawyer can be prosecuted. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a lawyer who works within um, the legal framework, does a client's work legally, but does something that the government doesn't like because um, you as a criminal lawyer are defending uh, an, um, an accused who is accused of terrorism. Just imagine that you would be uh, defending bin Laden in the US, then this work falls within the framework of what you are as a lawyer not only allowed to do, but what you are supposed to do, and the government cannot interfere. There cannot be any negative consequences for you, like arrest or disbarment or what have you, if you do that work. It's of the utmost importance that the legal profession so in this, we're talking about lawyers, attorney, is independent in that sense. That may, might sound to you as if, you know, that's obvious and what is the fuss, but there are many countries, if you look at the world, there are unfortunately many countries where lawyers face serious negative consequences if they represent certain clients. For instance, if you look at Turkey, if you represent um, a Kurdish client, uh, for uh, his political work in a court case, in a criminal court case, you will face serious problems as a lawyer. Uh, you will be looked as an accessory to terrorism and you will could face disbarment or imprisonment because the government interferes in this sense with your work. So for a country that upholds the rule of law, it is one of the basic principles for the whole group of attorneys that the government cannot interfere with their independence. The lawyer has to be able to do the job without any negative consequence from the government. So that's the more collective side of independence. Moving on to the second side of independence, um, that concerns the relationship, the individual relationship between attorney and client. The lawyer has to be independent in this individual relationship as well, which means the lawyer uh, is not allowed to be influenced uh, by, let's say, outside forces. So public opinion, for instance. If you have um, a client that... Um, uh, you know, a, a big company that uh, uh, is uh, not doing a very good job in, in, if you look at the environment, but you are rep uh, you represent this company in a labor conflict or whatever, uh, the public opinion, the negative opinion about this client in the public eye should not, cannot influence your work. Also, you, the independence uh, of a lawyer means that you are not influenced by other parties in the conflict. That means the judge or the opposing counsel or, in a criminal case, the prosecutor. So you 
as a lawyer have to you have to be pretty strong in order to withstand all the outside forces uh, that try to influence your work and think differently about the client or the case you cannot do that you have to be you have to maintain your independence with regards to all the players in the field whether it's the judges or the other lawyers and also with regards to the public at large the public opinion Another aspect of this side of independence in the relationship between the client is something that is often overlooked um, and that is you have to maintain independence also towards your client. You are the one with the expertise. Remember, expertise is also one of the five basic principles. You are the one with the legal expertise. You have to give objective legal advice to your client even if it's bad news so you cannot if a client comes to you uh, in a certain in a civil dispute he wants to sue his neighbor for whatever reason and you look at the law and you see there's just no grounds you then have to tell your client this you have to maintain this independence towards your client that you are not afraid to tell your client there is really no legal grounds to sue your neighbor. But the independence towards the client goes further than that. And that is where we have to discuss the relationship between partiality, the basic principle that we discussed in lecture three, and independence. Because it is a question, it is a, yeah, a problem how far this independence goes. And what I mean by that is this. In the partiality lecture, I briefly touched upon um, the question of the hired gun. In other words, the lawyer who just does whatever the client wants if it has legal grounds. So if the same case, if the neighbor comes to you, wants to, uh, the, the client comes to you, wants to sue his neighbor, and you don't believe that this has any uh, possibility of succeeding but there is a legal you know there is a legal stipulation under which you can sue you will just sue you will tell your client of course that the uh, possibility of winning might not be really great but there is a possibility of suing and if the client wants that you do it the question is is that in the best interest of the client and that question is really not that easy to answer because it goes to uh, another question who determines the client's interest is that you as a lawyer because you have the legal expertise or is that the client you know a client uh, an, a, an adult knows what he wants and he asks you to do it there is no real answer to this question it depends on how you as an individual attorney fill in the role of a lawyer, whether you feel that in the kind of work that you do, uh, your clients are mostly, for instance, corporate clients or corporations, they know what they're doing. So who are you as a lawyer to tell them what to do? You will look at the legal um, side of things, you will look at the legal framework, uh, you will study the law, and then you will give your advice, and if the client wants to proceed and wants to sue, you will do that, even though it might not be maybe a big possibility of winning that case. If you are a lawyer who rather who, who sees the role a little bit differently. And again, these are nuances in the role of the lawyer. The, 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 the core of serving your client, your client's interest is always the same. But of course, it's a matter of interpretation. Should you as a lawyer try to convince your client not to pursue a certain strategy? And how far are you going with that? If you, in the same uh, uh, example, if you feel that this corporation wants to sue uh, some other corporation and the, there is a possibility in the law to do that, but the chances are really slim and you don't feel that this is worth doing, should you, if the client still wants to do it, should you then go ahead and do it? Or should you say, 
I don't think that this is going to work. Uh, I'd suggest that you find yourself a different lawyer who is behind you 100% and is suing for you no matter what. You have to answer that individually. You have to always keep in mind, of course, uh, what is in the best interest of the client, but you also have to make individual choices. And that can also depend on what kind of case and what kind of client. I mean, a lot of times as a lawyer, you will come across a client who has just no clue about the legal framework. And in a setting like that, I would say, I would argue your responsibility uh, to convince the client that a certain uh, avenue is not the right way to go is far greater than when your client is the in-house counsel of a big corporation. You can still decide that you are not the right fit, that you are not the right lawyer for this particular client, of course, but your responsibility to um, convince the client that this is not the right way to go is less big, I would argue, if on the client side you have somebody who knows about the law, in, in my example, is an in-house counsel, so is a fellow lawyer, then you might say, well, if the client wants to do that, I'll do it. But I think that every lawyer who works cases um, has a, a little bit a different way of approaching that and a different way of setting um, his or her boundaries. And you have to do that as well as an individual lawyer. You have to ask yourself how much... Um, um, how much of the decision role uh, do you take as a lawyer and how much of the decision role do you leave up to your client? And again, there are no real uh, black and white boundaries for this question. But it is important that as a lawyer, because of the rule of independence and because you are uh, not... Um, you and the client are still two different entities, you have to answer that question. So, for instance, if there is something that you feel is really on the border of what is legally possible, but the client wants it, so you do it, and then you get slapped on the wrist by uh, the disciplinary courts for that. You can't, cannot argue, well, the, clients want, the client wanted it. No, no. You have your own responsibility as a lawyer to draw boundaries and limitations. But within the spectrum of what is possible, it is an individual decision. And some lawyers will lean more to what I called in the previous lecture, the hired gun, if they feel that it's legally okay. And I don't mean it's not illegal, but that it there is a legal argument to be made, even if that argument is maybe quite far-fetched and has not a big chance of winning, but there is a legal argument to be made, then they will say, well, the clients want it. I looked at the law. It's possible. I do it. And another lawyer that would lean more on the side of, I'm a, 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 an advisor who tries to convince the client of the right way to go, as it were, uh, that lawyer will not be as willing to do just everything within the legal possibilities that the client wants. Again, there is no right or wrong answer. There is, of course, the, 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 there are boundaries that you can't cross, even if you are a hired gun, if you define yourself as a hired gun. That's obvious, but there is still a spectrum of possibilities that one lawyer will answer differently uh, compared to another. And the last, uh, the last aspect that I want to briefly touch upon with regards to independence is, and I said that again in all the lectures, that we are discussing basic principles that are the same for all the lawyers in all the world if you have a country that upholds the rule of law. But th these basic principles apply everywhere. But 
the interpretation of these principles on the more you know uh, nitty gritty level of what is allowed or what is not allowed varies widely between countries. So it's always important to look at more specific rules of the country that you are working in. And with regards to independence, I just want to uh, mention one example. Uh, if you look at the Netherlands, uh, we, uh, the lawyers in the Netherlands, are not allowed to work on the basis of no cure, no pay. I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with no cure, no pay. It means that you don't get an hourly fee or a lump sum uh, uh, for your work, but that your fee depends entirely on um, the outcome of uh, the, uh, the proceedings. So if you sue for damages and if you lose, you get nothing as a lawyer. But if you win, the lawyer takes a percentage of uh, the money that the client gets as the fee. In the US, for instance, no problem. No cure, no pay is re is very common, and the lawyer takes 30 to 35, sometimes 40 percent of what the client gets as damages or remuneration, what have you. In the Netherlands, we argue that no cure, no pay is in direct conflict with the rule of independence, because the lawyer has an own an an, an, an interest of his own to win the case. So he will, or he might at least, um, try to, um, when he gives legal adv advice, he might try to be influenced, or he might be influenced by this own interest. Because if he sues, and if he wins, and if he wins big, he will get big money. So in the Netherlands, we feel that this no cure, no pay uh, possibility is not uh, compatible with independence. In the U.S., they come to a different conclusion, even though they also have the principle of independence. But uh, the U.S. regulations for lawyers feel that it is not a problem for independence if you have a no cure, no pay rule. The lawyer is still the legal expert and he should be strong enough to advise a client um, and not think of you know, the, the own money that he or she can earn when doing a certain case. So this is just as an example to, to uh, uh, illustrate that the same principle, independence, can have quite different um, regulations in two different countries. That's why, again, it is so important that when once you have the basic principles in your head, that's perfect. That's what we try to do with this course. But that still means that once you are admitted to a bar in a certain country, you will have to look at the more, uh, you know, the fine print, as it were, of that country and the regulations of that country. In the online chat, uh, we will talk about, we will talk about more, uh, uh, no, We'll talk more about the question, who is the boss? Is it you because you are the legal expert or is it the client because it's his case after all? And how you individually would navigate this, uh, you know, this field of independence versus partiality, hired gun versus real independent advisor. Um, and I'm looking forward to that discussion. But for now, this is it for the basic principle of independence. Thank you for watching. And I'm looking forward to our discussion on Thursday.